the topic of today is um, objects and um, object-oriented programming. Um, so this is uh, a concept that you should already be familiar with, having done Java in the first year. So it's a quick, um, a, a kind of everything you need to know about doing J JavaScript objects from the ground up. Um, and we, this is a completely new set of content, so it's quite possible we are going to miss things. And so if anything's not clear, feel free to ask questions or um, just shout and, and tell us that you want us to explain something a bit better. We'll be happy to do that. Um, so uh, an example. Uh, first up, um, we've got on the right-hand side, we've got an example picture that we've drawn. And to do this, we have uh, just got a very, very basic HTML page. It's got a canvas in it, and it's got a piece of JavaScript. And this, uh, this HTML really doesn't change throughout all of these examples. So we've got, uh, in index.html, a very straightforward little program in which we are trying to describe this rectangle that we want to draw. And so to do that, we have created five variables because it's got an X and a Y coordinate, which is the top left-hand corner. So that's rect X and rect Y. Then the rectangle has got a width and a height, and it's got a color, which we set to be a crimson red. So five properties are the things that describe how this rectangle looks. Um, Rich, I think yeah. for the first example, it might be useful if we gave that uh, canvas a quick border so we can see where it begins and where it ends. Because at first, when you said we drew a picture, it looked like we forgot to draw a picture on that red canvas. Okay, let's style this up. Canvas. Oh, no, look, dashed. Here is our huge oh, that big canvas. Very good. I shall make that slightly smaller just so you can really see it. So there you go. There's our canvas. And that is the canvas that's defined right here. And then we grab a handle on it so that we've got a context on that canvas to draw in. We set the fill style to be rectangle color, which is currently crimson. And then we do fill rect, which draws it. And we use the X, and the Y, and the width and height coordinates. So hopefully that that should make complete sense because we should have shown you most of this already, if not all of it already. So it should all be very familiar. So this takes us on to the next stage. And in this next stage, um, what we're going to do is add a second rectangle. So if I load this up, Here's our second rectangle, what it looks like. And now that we know what it looks like, we can understand the code a bit better. Our first rectangle stays the same. And our second rectangle, we've called it another rect. And it's got, again, an X and a Y coordinate, a width and a height. And this time, we do steel blue so that we can um, distinguish it on screen. Then the other thing to point out is that we then replicate the code that we used initially to draw the rectangle. So now we have another two lines. So there's a, a little bit of redundancy creeping in here, but we'll deal with that later. Um, but we are able to draw two rectangles on the screen. So hopefully that all makes sense. Can I just get a, a couple of checks off Slack or Lewis, can you respond? Is that all okay and making sense so far? Anyone that's got a microphone, let me know. Yep, all looks good to me. Good, okay. So let's go on to stage two. And stage two, as we can see on the output, it looks exactly the same. So let's go and have a look at how we differentiate the code here. Um, I mentioned that uh, repetition was creeping into the drawing. And I'm going to make this a little bit smaller, just so that hopefully I can do this. For some reason, I can't drag this at the moment, which is a shame. Ah, now I can. Great. Uh, so we mentioned that there was some redundancy creeping in the drawing. So what we've done in order to remove that is to create a draw rect function. And this now takes six parameters for the x and the y, the width and the height, and the color that we want to we want to draw it in, but also a C for the context that we want to draw the rectangle on. So we then call draw rect and we pass in all the parameters twice. So we've simplified our program. Now the obvious benefit to this is if we want to change the way we draw rectangles, we now change it in one place. We don't have to go through all the code and find all the different places. So 
it's always useful to refactor your code whenever you see um, a little bit of repetition creeping in. That's the time to create a function. So that's what we've done here. But what we haven't done yet is improve the way we're storing these variables, because there seems to be a lot of repetition in here as well, and it's quite wordy. And if it's OK for two rectangles, but what, what if we wanted 10 or 200? It's, it's really not going to scale having all of these variables like this. So that's where JavaScript objects can come in. Now, if I load up the next example, you'll see it looks exactly the same. So we know the output is still the same. So let's look at the code that generates it. Now we should see something that is, again, familiar um, in that we're using object notation that we've been using all year so far in order to create little structured objects. So none of this should be new yet. Um, here, rather than having multiple different variables as we had before, I'll see if I can get these side by side for you. Um, Rich, can you also close the lower part of the window with the problems output and stuff? I can, yes. Thank you. Uh, so we've got um, on the left, rectangle X, rectangle Y. But on the right, when we've used an object structure, it simplifies it significantly in terms of what it looks like. So that, that's a bit of a benefit. But we now have the idea that these these variables are now encapsulated. They've been We've made a little capsule of data. They're encapsulated within this object. And that's a fundamental part of object-oriented programming is this idea of encapsulation. So this is the beginning of that encapsulation. So now, rather than having a whole bunch of variables and a whole bunch of lines of code that just read top to bottom, we've now got two objects, rect and another rect. We've got a function. And then we are able to call the draw rect function. And now, instead of passing in six different parameters, we just pass in two because we can pass the rectangle object in twice. So we've modified the signature on our draw rect so that now it just takes two objects. So it's a much simpler signature. Our API has become simpler. So that's one of the bonuses, the major bonus of using objects to structure our data is that it makes everything easier to look at and easier to pass around. And the output is still the same, so that's good. So now if I close that, close that, close that, and now we can go to example number four. Now if I load example four on the right-hand side, you will see that the output is still the same. So. Here comes the big change. Up until now, when we've been creating objects, we've been doing it on the fly, and the properties that we put in those objects, we've just been able to choose ourselves. But it would be really great if we had a formal way of specifying which properties should be in the objects. And that's what the class gives us. So this is very similar to Java classes, so the the whole structure of it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. Um, the cl classes have only been added to JavaScript in the last couple of years, but the class keyword has been reserved since JavaScript was created. So it was foreseen back in 96 or so when it was first thought of that this would be a, a really important future progression for the language. And finally, it is now there. So JavaScript is now an object-oriented language. Um, so differences between this and Java. Um, in JavaScript, we can only have one constructor. We, we don't have the ability to have um, multiple constructors with different lists of parameters or different signatures, as it's called. Um, what we can do is we have one constructor. It's called constructor, and it takes a bunch of parameters. We don't have the idea, um, by default, of, of having to define um, properties up front. So in Java, you would say something like um, public um, x and uh, public y, uh, or maybe private x and private y. We don't have any of that in JavaScript. We just magically set variables by using the this keyword. So this should be familiar because it works exactly the same as in Java. Therefore, in our constructor, we've taken these five parameters. We've Bear in mind, Rich, that we do have some people from BIS who might not have seen Java before. Ah, excellent. How many people from BIS are on uh, the, the talk today? I, I don't think any this morning. Right. Shame. OK. Um, 
where was I? Yes. Uh, so we've now still got our draw rect function. And the key difference now is that rather than creating two objects manually up front, we can create our objects using new, and then we use the name of the class that we want to use. We pass in the parameters, and the object is made for us. So this makes the code, again, a little bit cleaner and a little bit simpler, and the, the objects are still drawn in the same way. So classes provide us with a formal way of structuring objects, of being able to say that we expect certain parameters to be there and to rely on those parameters as well. So example number five takes this a little bit further. Here we see the output from example number five. It looks exactly the same. And so the difference here is that now we have taken the draw function and we've moved it into the class. So because draw was about drawing rectangles, um, it's arguable that it makes sense that the rectangle should know how to draw itself. And so if we move the draw function into this, we no longer call it draw rect. And you'll notice that it doesn't need the keyword function up in front of it. So our class definition has got essentially a number of class, uh, a number of uh, functions that can exist within it. And that's really all a class definition is. It's a bunch of variables and some functions. So this idea of encapsulation isn't just about encapsulating data. It's about encapsulating the functions that can operate on that data as well. So the key difference now then is that between four and five, if I bring up four here on the left, Previously, we were calling draw rect, passing a context and the rectangle that was to be drawn. But now in this version, we are telling the rectangle to draw itself on the context that we pass it. So draw takes a context, and then it uses this dot col to get its own color, and then the x and the y and the width and the height. So this is where we go from using the um, the rectangle that was passed in and using X and Y properties from that rectangle to using our own properties here. So this is rather nice. And this does somewhat make the code a little bit smaller and simpler because the actual program now is really only a couple of lines long. And we've broken out most of the complex code. OK, so that was example number five. If I can find my pointer, thank you. Bringing up example number six, you can see we are now going to be adding some circles. So given that we've got a rectangle, let's see how we'd add a second type of shape. And that's the circle. And you'll see that the constructor works in much the same way as the rectangle. We've got x and y coordinate, a radius this time instead of width and height, and a color still. So we set the properties in exactly the same way as before. We change the draw function because circle obviously requires something a little bit different. So we still set the fill style. So that there's some duplicate code there. So if we were writing um, functions now, we might think about writing a function to do this thing repeatedly. Um, then we begin the path. We use the arc to draw the circle, and then we fill the circle. When we want to create the circle, we give it an x coordinate, a y coordinate, a radius, and a color. And so we create two of these. Oh, and we've renamed these at the moment from um, rect and another rect to rect one and rect two. And then we just ask circles to draw themselves. So we've created two circles, and we've asked them to draw themselves. And here, we've been able to create two different objects, one of class rectangle, one of class circle. So now we've got things defined up front, which is quite good if we want to specify that we want to draw things in a particular way or hold data in a particular way. It's not perfect yet, though. Is that a question about to come in? Um, yeah, Rich, yes. Uh, so it's not a question from the audience. Um, it's coming from me. I'm looking at lines 42 through 45. Yes, we're defining two rectangles and two circles. Makes all the sense. Uh, lines 50 and on, they all look the same. We are doing something four times. This looks like we could put all those rectangles and circles in an array instead of four variables and just draw each thing in the array that's a good idea 
Let's come to that. I like that. Maybe we can do that in a few minutes. So uh, example number seven. We're going to go slightly further with the um, the thinking about repetition before we get to, to sort out the repetition down here. There's some repetition up top because there are there are common, let's jump back a sec, there are commonalities here. Look, rectangle has got an X and a Y and a color, and circle has got an X and a Y and a color. So it might be nice to be able to start thinking about superclasses and subclasses. So that's what we do here in example seven. We are going to create a new shape class which has got the common properties of X and Y and color. Then our rectangle and our circle class have been changed now to say that they extend shape. So rectangle now will inherit the X and the Y and the color properties of its superclass that it extends. And in the constructor, when these X and Y and color things are provided, we call super. And super calls the constructor of the superclass, which is this constructor here. So when our rectangle is constructed and we pass in the parameters, three of those parameters are passed up to the superclass and they get initialized for us. We then set the width and the height and our rectangle is constructed. Similarly with circle, the X and the Y and the color, they can be passed up to the superclass constructor and the only thing we need to store locally within each instance of the circle is the radius. So that makes each of these classes slightly simpler by abstracting that. We haven't yet made this cleaner, but the code all still works exactly the same. Did I load seven already? No, I didn't. Let's just check it works. There is seven working. So we can see that this all still works and the output is still exactly the same. But now we have three classes. Our code has got a little bit longer, but hopefully each piece, each thing that it does is a little bit clearer and easier to understand. So in this next example, and I'm going to load it straight away, we can see the output of example number eight is still very, very clear. Um, it hasn't changed at all. But now in index, our code is a lot smaller, and we have decided we are going to import circle and rectangle. And we can do this because we have moved the code for our classes into a separate JavaScript module. JavaScript modules, um, by convention, have an MJS class name. And here is the code that you should already be familiar with. Here's our shape, here's our rectangle, and here's our circle. And the only difference in each of these is that I'm now exporting each of them. So these are now available to be imported by any other piece of JavaScript. So here's our JavaScript. We import circle and rectangle. We don't need to import shape because we're not actually creating any shapes ourselves. They just magically use it. And so we still have this slightly repetitive code, but now we are able to say that our program that draws these shapes on screen is now very small. We don't have to worry about the implementation of circle and rectangle normally because we don't care about that. If we're drawing a picture, we just want to have the primitives of circle and rectangle and be able to use them. So this now becomes a library that we're able to use. So that, that's really good. Now, the only, the only other change, the one small change that we've had to make to our HTML here is we have to tell the JavaScript that it is of type module. If you don't do that, you're not allowed to use the import and export keywords. So this is a necessity here. So that's the one change that happens to index HTML. Rich? Yeah. Um, I would like to point out on top of that in index.js that, um, so if, if you go to index. Uh, which one did you open? Um, this is not the one. Stage nine. That one. Very good. We are only importing circle and rectangle. We don't care that they inherit from shape. We're not actually in this code using the shape class. It's just an implementation detail of those two circle and rectangle classes. Thank you. Um, okay, so example number nine. Let's take a quick look at it first, see the output. There we go. The output is exactly as we might expect. So that repetitive code with those variables that Jack didn't like earlier with the 
wrecked one, wrecked two, circed one, circed two. We've got rid of them because we don't necessarily need them. We can just do it by having an array of shapes. And when we create the shapes, here they all are. We create the array. We create the shapes one after the other and have them in the array. And then we want to draw them. We can just loop around it. So um, Jack, does that answer your question from earlier? Um, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether to do that a couple of stages earlier or not. And I think you've 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 kind of confirmed to me that I do want to do it a bit earlier. So that's good. So these shapes, we don't have to give them variable names. They are just things that appear on a page. Um, so there we go. Oh, someone's just arrived as well. Hello, extra person. Ah, oh, it's Angemol. Okay, so that was example number nine. And example number 10 adds one last little thing to the discussion. Now you'll notice that the page looks slightly different. The contents have moved. And in 10, you'll see that here, when I'm drawing the shapes, rather than just drawing them, I'm moving them before I draw them. And every shape is moved. So how does that work? Well, you'll see that in shape, um, I have created a new um, function called move by. This move by takes two parameters, x and y, and it adds the x value onto the current x value of the object, and the same with the y added to the current y value of the object. So this move by function, or because we're talking in object-oriented terms, this move by method, it's defined in shape, and therefore it is available to everything that extends shape. So both rectangle and circle now have this move by method. Therefore, here, when we're looping over our shapes, it doesn't matter that it's a rectangle or a circle that we are dealing with. Whatever the shape is, we call move by on it, and the move by moves the shape, and then we can draw it. So with encapsulation, encapsulation is an inheritance of brilliant because they enable us to provide functions that operate and mutate the internals of objects without us needing to know how the objects work. So that, that's really kind of the, the, the basics of classes in JavaScript. The one next stage that I would have created if I had time, which I'll sort of do here, is to talk about getters and setters. Um, uh, Rich? Yeah? Before you talk about getters and setters, I would like to point out one um, important difference from yeah. Java. If you go back to stage uh, 10 or 9 index.js, please. Here's 10 index.js. Very good. We have the array of shapes and contains rectangles and circles. And on each of the shapes, we call draw. In Java, we would have a typed array that would be, uh, that would contain shape objects. But the shape class doesn't have draw. So in Java, we couldn't call draw on each of those objects, even though we guarantee in our code that they will have that draw function. In Java, we would have to define an abstract draw function on shape. Shape doesn't know how to draw itself, so that function would not be able to do anything. It would have to be abstract. And in JavaScript, that's not necessary. In Java, uh, what we do is invoking a mechanism called polymorphism, where we have the abstract function draw on shape, and then rectangle has one implementation of it, and shape has another implementation of it. And uh, so different subclasses have different uh, ways of implementing things. And that's, like I said, commonly known as polymorphism, different forms, so to speak. In JavaScript, polymorphism often is used in um, a more funny named way called duck typing. If it quacks like a duck, if it walks like a duck, it's likely a duck. In this case, if it has a draw method, it can draw itself. Shape doesn't have to have a draw method because it can't draw itself. But we expect that every subclass of shape will have a draw method. So on lines 20 through 23 in the code that we can see right now, we can call draw 
even though the array is really an array of shapes, we don't even have to know that there is a class shape. Um, yeah, the point about abstract is really important. It's something that I really miss having um, spent several years as a full-time Java programmer. It's it's one of the things that I regularly look for in the Java specs. Has it has it has it arrived yet? Do we do we have abstract? Do we have interfaces? No, we don't. Interesting so your interface where you must implement certain methods. Yeah. So um, you, the, on the audio that you were both talking at the start, so I couldn't hear what Matt was saying. Uh, I said, so there's still no concept of an interface where they mandate that you must implement certain functions. No, there isn't. Now, um, that brings us to another difference, well, the big difference between Java and JavaScript in that um, JavaScript is dynamically typed. Now, there are forms of JavaScript that um, are much stricter than that. Um, flow and TypeScript come to mind which are compiled into JavaScript. And I would be really surprised if TypeScript didn't have interfaces. I think if you want JavaScript with interfaces, what you actually really want is something like TypeScript. Right, I'm trying to rearrange this screen a bit now, so. Okay. <laughs> Right, so a little bit of uh, live coding as well. I mentioned getters and setters. Now, um, one of the important pieces of encapsulation that uh, more classical um, object-oriented languages like Smalltalk and Java do well is the idea that you can have um, variables that are protected. The uh, Essentially, every object is thought of as a hard shell, and you can't access the variables that are within that hard shell unless you go through a method in order to access them. Uh, and those methods are called getters to get the, the value and setters to set the value. And if you use a getter, it should be giving you a copy of the value. So if you change the value that you got, it doesn't change the thing that's in the object. JavaScript isn't so strict about that, but it does give us some nice getters and setters or the ability to create them. So, uh, for example, if I wanted to have access at the moment to the X and Y values of a shape, let's go and see how I might do that. So let's say um, uh, console.log s.x. Let's see if I can log the X values for each of the things as I load the page. And yes, I can. I have direct access to the X values. Now, that's not particularly um, good. So one of the things that tends to happen is um, there's a convention where um, internal values have an underscore put in front of them. And I'm going to go through and manually do this and see how, how many mistakes I can make. Uh, width and height. So yeah, while Rich is doing that, it, it is a convention. So basically, programmers know that if an object has a property that whose name starts with an underscore, and uh, you are not the implementer of that object, you shouldn't be touching that property because it's likely to change in future ver versions. It's something internal. It's not part of the public API. OK, I've managed to change it all. So now we have, now we have got our semi-private variables. So if I now, what we'll now see, the output from this look is now showing undefined. So that in this code, where we're talking about s.x, well, internally, there is no s.x now, because it's actually called s.underscore.x. So if I were to change that to underscore and reload, we can then again see it. Getters and setters allow us to have access to variables, though. So if I were to say get a value of x and return this dot underscore x. So now I'm creating a getter for the x values. And whereas previously that wouldn't work, because we were using that. Now, when I reload, we can see it does. So if I take this getter off, it doesn't work. If I re-enable the getter, 
it works. Now, the important thing to notice here is s dot x, I'm not calling x as a function and putting open and close brackets. I am calling x, or I'm, I'm referring to x as if it is a property. There are no open and close brackets on this x, and yet it still works. And it is my function here that is being called. So this getter, although we define it as a function, it is visible as a property. If I were then to say um, s dot x equals 50, so try and set the value of that thing, you're going to get an error because we cannot set a property of something that, that um, has only got a getter. So here, if I also then say, set x val this dot x equals val. So now I've created a setter for x. I take a value, I set the value of x internally using what I know is my internal value to it, and I save that. Well, and if I also, in index.js, move this so that for each of the shapes, I'm moving its x value to 50 and then drawing it. There we go. <laughs> so the squares appear with the top left-hand corner at 50, and the circles have their center x value at 50. So getters and setters provide a very powerful way of of giving us this encapsulation properly, this, this idea that internal variables on an object should only be accessed and mutated through getters and setters. Right. So, one, one potential, you might think, what's the point in doing that? Because he's just, you know, I'm calling a setter, but it's just doing the same thing as, um, for example, you know, as it was before, directly manipulating that internal variable. But you might be now, what we can do is we could actually write a check on our set x uh, setter so that we know that, that what you've been given is actually a number. So instead, if somebody, you know, sent uh, the wrong kind of value to it, you can actually say, no, you can't set that because it's not a number or it's bigger than my canvas is or it's a negative value or something strange. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, however, if you don't do those checks and you find yourself having code like what Rich just had, Rich, can you show that MJS code, please, again? Um, if you do find yourself having a getter and a setter that just straightforwardly return an internal value and set the internal value, you really can just get rid of them and use .x instead. But um, if you do want to do checks like this, getters and setters allow you to, that, to do that and the users don't have to care. But another um, example that I would like Rich to do now, if he's willing, uh -huh. is have uh, a read-only property for area. We could have a getter for area that returns how big a shape is. And naturally, we can't actually, um, we can't set the area of something because what we really need to change is dimensions. Uh, no, shape doesn't have area of zero. Shape just doesn't have area. Drop that getter, please. I want to see it working and, and failing first. Yes. So. Oh, area, it's not a function. <laughs> There we go. So four undefined. That can't be defined. Ah, I haven't been there. we go. So four of them are returning zero. So we could have it return undefined, but it might make sense to, to, to return zero by default, and then you've got to override it. So this is about the only way we can have something that needs to be overridden and force developers to overwrite something for us without having abstract um, classes. Um, in that vein, I would not return zero because zero is a valid uh, area. I would throw an error. That forces developers to do something. So yes, I would just drop that. Um, area of a rectangle, of course, is height times width. Not x. 
I'd have done width times height. Yeah. So there we go. We've got two rectangles now that are returning 20,000 as their area. Um, and two circles that are still returning undefined. Area. This shows that getters are often very helpful if you have computed values. And you could have just a function that's called get area. But that would mean you have to type get extra and the two parentheses extra when it's really just like a property. So dot area is better code than dot get area parentheses. Can do the power two? Yes, that's definitely not right. Uh, no, uh, you have to have two of those uh, those symbols after there. Yeah, two of those. Yeah, and you need to close your brackets. Oh no! Oh, star star, not that star star. Oh, star star. That's exponentiation. There we go. So we've created an area function for each, or an area. We've created an area function, but it's accessible as a property. So getters are great. That's a nice example, Jack. I like that one. Um, the other thing that I could mention also is that there is a experimental and not very well supported feature at the moment, uh, which is for private fields. Now, I'm not sure how we can use them in this example, so I'll have a quick think. And uh, we'll make X and Y private. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, those of you that do remember Java will remember that there's a difference between um, public uh, or default public, private, and protected. And a protected um, value can be accessed by subclasses, but a private value cannot. So if we were to make X and Y protected values, then we might be able to do it through the getters and setters maybe. But I haven't done it yet, so I don't know if it would work or not. No, protected, um, we, we couldn't easily do that. But if underscore X and underscore Y are private, um, but we have the getter for X, we could have a getter for Y as well, possibly, um, and not the setter, because we want to use move by. And uh, then where the subclass wants to draw itself, it wouldn't use the private property, it would use the getter. Okay, so turn this X. For some reason, there, uh, I think I've worked out which button I'm pressing. It, it's when it jumps onto the, a different editor, it's because the my, my computer is being a little bit misbehaving. So I think that's just about every va value of X in the shape. We've got a getter and we've got a setter. We need to do it for Y as well. Well, we really probably don't want the setters. Let's remove them then. If we are having uh, private properties, we are, it, it is because we want to restrict the people who are using this code from doing some things. We want to disallow them from accessing these properties or changing them willy-nilly without us knowing. So that's why I suggested removing the setters, because in a code like this with private properties, we would probably not have direct setters like that. Okay, that, I've done it and it works. So let's go through and have a quick look at what we've done here. So um, now the first thing to note is that the linter is giving us a little red C here. It doesn't like it because it doesn't understand about um, the hash um, character yet. So in order to create private variables or private fields, you put a hash in front of it and you have to define it right at the top before the constructor. So here we're going to say that there's two private fields. One is called X and one is called Y. 
whenever we're referring to them, we use exactly the same syntax as this de facto underscore, but now we use the hash, which is part of the JavaScript definition. And that means that this field is private and you can't see it. Um, and you can't access it from outside. Therefore, you need to have getters and setters defined. And that's it. That, that, that's a way of actually doing real encapsulation. Um, I, didn't I would call it strict encapsulation. It is, but it's, it's good. It, now, it, it, it's something that's being developed actively at the moment. You it's, mentioned that uh, this isn't uh, quite well supported yet. Could we check, can I use? Yes, we can. Um, when I looked at it about four days ago, it's supported in Chrome and Edge and not supported by Safari and Firefox. But those are not the only JavaScript runners that we use on the web. Oh, it is supported by Node. And that's an important thing. When you find new features in the language, like private properties here, and you want to use them, you may not be able to use them in your client-side code because the browsers that are out there, the majority of them don't support it, or a minority you care about don't support it. So here we see Firefox doesn't support it, uh, Safari doesn't support it. So yeah, we can't use these things in uh, the wild in browsers. But we have full control over our server side. We can choose which version of Node we are running exactly the same way that we cannot choose the version of browser that our users are running. Mm. So because we can choose the version of Node we are running, we can use these new features much faster on the server than we can in browsers. I'm wondering if I can get a better view of these. I want to see which version of uh, Edge it first started supporting it in. Not helping us, never mind. Okay, so that was um, a quick fly through of classes. You can use classes to structure your code better um, and they can be very useful.